All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to get to be with you all today. We are going to try to crank through Esther 4 through 7 today. I know that feels like a lot, uh, but a lot of it is just narrative. So I, I think there's 50-some verses in there. So we got to go through a verse a minute, basically, which feels impossible, <laughs> but I think it actually could work. Um, and, and as we do so today, I also want to put before you some of the images that I had from last time from Esther 1 to 3. Esther 1 to 3 is really that rising action, right? We've got this new queen, and now Haman has issued his edict. And I want to clarify something I said last time as well. I think last time I said that he issued that edict in the month of Adar at the start of that last month of the year. That's not actually true. It, it, if you look at Esther 3, it, it pretty clearly says actually, so I'm sorry I missed this. Uh, then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and the officials. So it's the first or the 13th day of the first month, the month of Nisan. Okay? So that 13th is when Haman's edict is issued. Um, and I've got a calendar up here. We're going we're gonna to get to this calendar at the end, hopefully. Uh, if we don't get through seven, we're not going to get to the calendar, though. So we've got to get moving if we want to get to our calendar. Um, but I think it's actually important. And I I see something with it uh, that is, frankly, a little novel. I haven't been able to find it anywhere else, which probably means that you should totally disregard it. Um, but I think it's cool, and it's at least an interesting way to think about this book and, and its tie into the gospel message. Uh, so we'll get there when we get there. But let's take off in Esther chapter 4 then. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. So to the best of our reading, right, this is still Nisan 13, right? This is that very first day the edict is issued that... Later that year, basically at the end of the year, 11 months from now, on the 13th day of Adar, of the last month of the year, anybody who wants to kill the Jews can go kill them, right? That's the edict that Haman has issued, which obviously for us, we understand that the real problem here is what happens to the line of Christ if every Jew gets wiped out? The line is over, right? This is a threat against God's plan of salvation. Which, of course, does God let any threats to his plan of salvation stand? I don't think so. <laughs> you are correct, right? God will not let that stand, and that's what the rest of the book of Esther is going to be about. About how God steps in. Now, again, one of the challenges of the book of Esther is that God's name isn't mentioned. But as followers of the Lord, as followers of Christ, we can look at this and we can see his hand in the background, right? But this is still Nisan 13. Mordecai tears his clothes. He enters into mourning. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Notice this probably says something pretty negative about Ahasuerus, or at least I would argue it. Um, you are not allowed to mourn in the king's presence. If you are in sackcloth and ashes, you cannot enter into the presence of the king, because, well, then you're just a killjoy. Right? That's effectively what is being said here. Mordecai can't enter, but he goes right up to the gate. He gets as close as he can. Notice he's still actually honoring the authority, even though the authority has put out a horrible rule. He's still honoring that authority, and he's standing at the king's gate, weeping and mourning. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. This is a proper response in the face of suffering. God's people are crying out, they are mourning, they are weeping, they are begging for deliverance. Verse 4, when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. So, this sounds good, right? Esther is distressed. But keep reading, she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. What's Esther upset about? Sackcloth. Yeah, she's upset about Mordecai's mourning. Now, there's a reason for this, and we'll see this in the narrative. It's not that she's being insensitive to the plight of her people. She doesn't know. All right? And that's going to come clear for us in the narrative. She doesn't know the edict that's gone out. Right? She's unaware of that. But even there, this should probably be a cause for concern. And it's something I think we do often. Uh, when, when we see people in grief, we tend to get very uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable. It feels like something that we're not sure what to say, where we don't have the words. And so we would rather 
People clothe themselves and hide their grief and hide their emotion and, and just pull up your bootstraps, right? Put your boots on and, and get through it. I think that's not right. I don't think this is viewed well in Esther's narrative. To be fair, we're all sinful and this is the one mistake I can see her make throughout the book. So a pretty minor mistake in the grand scheme of things. But when we have someone in our lives who is mourning, who is hurting, we shouldn't be telling them, hey, get over it. We should be there mourning with them. This is what Paul says when he says, mourn with those who mourn in the book of Romans. Verse 5, then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to a tender, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. So now notice the secondary action is, oh, why are you sad? Right? That should be our first action. In the face of mourning, our first action should be, what's going on? Why are you weeping? Not, dry your tears, get over it, right? And that's effectively what she had said, and Mordecai said no to that. Uh, verse 6, Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. It's a substantial sum of money, 10,000 talents of silver, if you go back into chapter 3. Um, so that's effectively 75,000 pounds of silver. Right? That, that's a lot of silver. Um, he is paying a great deal in order to be able to wipe out the Jews. Because, remember, Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. That's the root problem here. And this is what Haman is using to go after all of the Jews, not just Mordecai, but to cast his vengeance upon all of God's people. Verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. So notice, Mordecai is making his case to Esther. He gives her a copy of the edict. He tells her exactly how much money Haman is going to spend to make this happen. He is marking down the details, and he is doing all of this so that she might beg for favor from King Ahasuerus, so that she might go into the palace, go into the king's chambers, and beg for mercy for her people. Um, now, again, we haven't actually looked at this map yet. I know I drew up a really rough one. Um, but this is a map of the Persian Empire. And if you're looking for Susa, it's kind of right in the middle. It's one of those main capital cities right in the middle uh, near Babylon, just to the southeast of Babylon. Um, so this is one of the capital cities. It's really, it's described as the winter capital in some of the histories uh, of the area, which kind of makes sense because if you're looking at it, it is one of the further south main cities within the empire. Um, so as it gets colder, sometimes we like to go south, right? We can picture people who go to Florida in the winter uh, who, who don't enjoy this beautiful snow outside. Um, I think we should enjoy it. It is beautiful in its own way. Just be reminded every time you look at snow that our sins have been made as white as snow, right? That, that, that's a good way to remember it. Um, but this is what's going on here. So this is Susa. And then I wanted to show you some pictures of the palace. These are the remains of the palace. So you can see actually here's some of really even the foundation, right? You can see all of the various rooms of the palace. And then if you were to build this up, um, it would look something like this. This is obviously an artist rendition. Um, but you might be able to see that these pillars are pretty unique. And the reason why we know those pillars are unique is because we have copies of these pillars that have been preserved. Um, so if you look at the top, you can see these oxen that are kind of the carving at, at the top of the pillar. The oxen obviously being an animal of strength, of might, an animal that's holding up the house, the palace of the king. Um, and these are just really beautifully done, beautiful carvings. Uh, it, it tells us a little bit about the wealth of Persia as we look at this. And then actually, it, when we looked at it, it talked about how the floor even were these beautiful frescoes of precious stones and gems that were kind of painted to make and look beautiful. Um, this is a one of the frescoes that they found in the ruins of this palace. Now again, obviously they've done stuff to this, right, to, to restore some of its beauty. Um, I, I highly doubt when they found it in the ruins of King Darius's palace that it looked exactly like this. Um, if we rewind again to what the palace looks like today, I'm thinking that it wasn't sitting there just perfect for them to find. Um, but obviously, if you find all the puzzle pieces of these ancient pieces of art, of these ancient frescoes, 
you can put them all back together and you can add some of the color back in and you can see that this is something that might have been hanging on the wall or even sitting on the floor as it's described here in the book of Esther. It tells us something about the riches and the power and the wealth of this kingdom, right? Which also should say to us, well, if the king had this much wealth already, why does he feel the need to take 75,000 pounds of silver uh, that are just effectively blood money? That he knows are blood money, right? He knows that it's just being used to wipe out somebody. Again, probably speaks to his unfaithfulness. But as we look, we're going to see that God is still going to take this and use it to his glory. Um, we'll keep it on that fresco for now. We'll get to the next image shortly. So, verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So Esther tells Mordecai the problem. Mordecai is begging Esther to go in and speak to the king, to advocate for her people, to say, this is wrong, you're killing a bunch of innocent people, don't do this. I'm one of them, right? Your queen, your wife, is one of these people that Haman once did. That's what Mordecai is telling her to say. What's the problem? She's afraid he'll put her to death, right? Because when can you go see the king? Only when you are summoned, and if you go without being summoned, the law is that you are put to death unless the king holds out the magic scepter, right? The, the golden scepter. It's not magic or anything, but it, he's just saying, he's bestowing his favor upon you. He's saying, yep, I didn't summon you, you should be put to death, but I am showing you instead my mercy by means of this scepter. And how long has it been since Esther has even been in to see the king? A month, 30 days. She's saying, uh, I, I don't know if I've done anything wrong, but, you know, the king hasn't seen me for 30 days, and now you're telling me that I'm supposed to go in there, even though I haven't been summoned, and I'm supposed to put my life on the line? And Mordecai, this just isn't done. All of the servants, all of the people, everybody knows this. And actually, I think there's probably a, a veiled shot here. You know this. You know the rules of the king. Because remember, he's a courtier in some way, shape, or form within the king's palace. He has an inn here within the palace already. He knows the rules. And he knows that he is asking Esther to break the rules. To put her life at risk so that she can go save God's people. Right? And we do need to take this seriously. And we do need to really consider this. Because what Esther does is an act of courage. An act of bravery. Right? Now, Mordecai is offering her good advice, and, and we don't want to downplay Mordecai's contributions to this tale. Mordecai is a faithful man, a, a man who has raised his niece, now effectively his daughter, right, his adopted daughter, who has raised her well and now continues to try to influence her life positively. Right? But what he is asking her to do is a very difficult thing. Right? It would be like me asking you, hey, I want you to go over to Iran, and I want you to go into the courts of the ruler of Iran, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, sorry, and, and I want you to go in there and I want you to tell him about Jesus. Is that a faithful thing? Yes. Yeah. Is that a dangerous thing? <laughs> you better believe it, right? And, and all of us, I think, would rightly be shaking in our boots a little bit at this. This is scary. This isn't easy. This is a difficult task that is being set before this saint, this holy person in God's kingdom, Esther. Verse 12. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. So this is Mordecai's advice. He's saying, hey, look, you can try to cling to your position. You are the queen. But don't think that you're going to escape. Yeah, nobody knows that you're a Jew. But somebody's going to find out. And if this happens to all of us, guess what's going to happen to you when they find out? You're going to be toast too. Right? And verse 14, here's actually the real promise of God in the midst of this. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Right? This is Mordecai's cry of faithfulness. He says, look, even if you keep silent, what is God going to do? Deliver his people. He's going to save us. He's going to deliver us because this is what God does. God delivers his people even when we are weak. 
right? Even when we don't do what we should. But Mordecai offers up a word of warning. He says, but you and your father's house will perish, which ultimately is the truth of faith, right? If you don't have faith, what's the result? You perish. Mordecai is speaking the truth here to Esther. He's saying, look, if you don't have faith that God can deliver you, that God can deliver us, that God can use you to accomplish this, then you will perish. There's no other option. You have faith or you die. Mordecai is speaking truth here. It's hard truth, truth that we don't typically want to hear, but it's truth that Esther needs. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is perhaps the most famous verse in Esther, um, that we might have come to this, you might have come into this position for such a time as this. And frankly, this is something that we believe as Christians, that God works together all things for the good according to those who love him, right? That God is always at work. Now I say all this, and frankly, actually, I don't even like using that verse in the midst of tragedy because it actually kind of misses the point. Um, if I'm talking to a family that has just lost a child and I say, well, you know, God works all things together for the good. I'm not speaking gospel there. I'm speaking a pious platitude that's actually probably going to hurt them even more. Well, sure, I know that God works things together for the good, but it doesn't feel good right now as I'm mourning the loss of a child. It sure doesn't feel good right now as I'm mourning the loss of a spouse. It sure doesn't feel good right now as I'm tasting this sting of death, as I'm feeling it in my life. That is a promise that we give later as we offer the first and foremost the comfort that Christ gives to us in the midst of our suffering, that is, Christ has suffered for us. Christ has died for us. Christ has risen for us. And so we can speak that promise of resurrection in the life of all of those who depart in faith. That's the promise we have. That's the promise we cling to. And then secondarily, we lean on this promise. So after we've healed a little bit, after that grief has lessened, then we can say, hey, you still might never see it. You might never know why X, Y, or Z happened, right? But God is still going to take it and he's going to use it for his glory and for the betterment of his kingdom. That's the promise we have. And that's the promise that Mordecai speaks to Esther. And he reminds her, hey, you've been called for a reason. And, and what a gift it is that we actually can go through life and know that we have purpose and we have reason. Maybe it's we're called to be grandparents. Maybe it's we're called to be a spouse. Maybe it's called, we're called to be a brother or a sister. Maybe we're called to be a neighbor. Maybe we're called to be a citizen, whatever. We all have all of these various callings that God has given to us for a reason. Now, if we spend all of our time trying to suss out the reason, we're actually kind of missing the point. Because God has given us the reason, and so we just need to trust that there's a reason and go about the task that God has set before us. If you want to know why you've been called to be a certain child's parent, go out and parent them. If you want to know why you've been called to be someone's brother or sister, be a brother or a sister to them. If you want to know why you've been called to be somebody's neighbor, be a neighbor to them and see what God does with that, right? That's my best advice within this beautiful verse, this beautiful reminder of our callings. Verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Maybe that sounds fatalistic, but I actually think that's a pretty faithful articulation of our walk in Christ. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they also say this. We'll get there when we get to Daniel in a couple of years. Um, <laughs> but when we get there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, um, as he's about to throw him in the furnace, they say, hey, God could save us from this. We have no worries about that. God is capable of saving us even from this fire. God can save his people from anything. But if he decides not to save us, well, then we die, right? And at the end of the day, for those of us who die in the Lord, what promise do we have? That we get to live with him forever, right? This is Paul's promise that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, this isn't fatalistic. I would argue this is just faithful. This is saying, God, I'm going to do the task that you set before me, even when it's dangerous, even when I'm a little scared. And if something bad happens to me, well, then something bad happens to me. So be it, right? And at the end of the day, all we can do is be faithful and trust God's promises. If we die, we die. And then we get to rejoice with him in eternity. So... 
Esther here, I think, is actually saying the faithful thing here, where she's saying, hey, I'm going to do this difficult task, even though it is difficult, and then no matter what the outcome is, I can at least say, I have been faithful. I've done what God has said before me. Right? And what a great, <laughs> what a great look at how we should go about handling our difficult tasks. I'm going to be praying for three days. I'm going to be fasting for three days. I'm going to be taking this seriously. And please pray for me for the next three days. Please fast for me the next three days. Please, let's all be taking this to God for the next three days because this is going to be hard. And who's the one who strengthens us? God. Right? What a faithful instance of how we should be handling the difficult tasks in our life. Relying on our own strength? No. No. Relying on His. I think there's a significance in the three days, too. Yeah, I definitely think there's a significance in the three days. Anytime we see the number three in Scripture, our, our minds should instantly be hardwired. As good Lutherans, it should be hardwired to be like, oh, three days, who else was in the tomb for three days? Yeah. Jesus was, right? And then he came back to life. He rose again, and death was defeated. Yes, anytime we see the number three, and especially three days, I, I'm 100% with you, Don. I, I think that's a good and faithful interpretation. It should instantly point us to Christ. Um, and, and this is one of the challenges of Esther is, well, where do we find Christ in all of this? If God's name isn't even mentioned, well, how do we find Jesus? Um, and I think that's the starting point. I think we look at three days. Interesting. What, what an interesting choice of time to wait. Um, and as we look at the calendar, I think it's going to get more interesting. But three days for a reason, okay? It's a holy number. It's a number that points us to the time that Jesus was in the tomb for us, to the time that Jesus suffered death for us, and to the time that Jesus rose again for us. Verse 17, Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Again, what a faithful uncle slash adopted father. All right, you've given me what you want me to do, I'm going to go do it. You want me to pray for you for three days? You want me to not eat for you for three days? I'm in. Right? I'm happy to do this for you because I love you and I care about you. It's this beautiful interplay between, frankly, child and parent. Right? That we should be striving for in our lives as parents and children. Um, where we are trying to eagerly love and support one another in both directions, whether we're the child or whether we're the parent. Uh, chapter 5, then. Any questions on chapter 4? I think we're doing okay on time. I think we're going to be Not eating or drinking yeah. for three days. I could take the eating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and on the drinking front, um, with that, the traditional fast is that you don't eat or drink during the day. Um, now, I know it says the night. What probably would happen is that at night, they would be allowed to drink water. Not wine, though, because wine's a celebratory drink. But obviously, can you even go three days without drinking water? No, you die, right? Um, they're not miracle workers. I mean, they could be miracle workers. I, I don't know that. But uh, my, my assumption here is the standard fasting rule is that at night, you can drink water, right? So that you don't die. Um, because if you die while you're fasting, that kind of defeats the purpose of the fast. Um, since the fast is there to kind of strengthen you and direct you and point you to the task that you have in front of you. But yeah, good point. That, that part would also be worse. I, I certainly, I feel like I could go three days without eating pretty easily, but not having a glass of water during the day would feel pretty miserable, actually. Um, that, that would be the harder part for sure. All right, chapter five, on the third day. So we've got Haman's edict, and then we've got day one, Day two, and on the third day, so my assumption here is that this is Nisan 16, okay, that we're on Nisan 16. This is when Esther goes to the king the first time. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. Notice, Esther uses some worldly wisdom here. She dresses herself beautifully um, as she's going to the king. She puts on her royal robes so that he can be reminded, who is Esther? Queen. His queen. His beautiful, lovely, faithful queen. Right? And she stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. So this is full pomp and circumstance, right? The king is on his throne, the king is casting his judgments, the king is in his full might, and Esther comes and stands before him as queen. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. All right, so difficulty number one, accomplished. She's gotten in to see the king, and the king has had favor. The king has held out the scepter to her. I would argue God is already at work here, right, making sure that what needs to happen happens. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. 
uh, all that is is just a gesture of respect, right? Thank you for showing me favor. Now I return that favor to you. I touch the tip of the scepter to show that you're the one in control here, that you're in power. Um, and as Esther goes about this, Esther, especially when you look at how the ancient world operates, Esther is going to very beautifully kind of set the stage here for what she wants to get done. Um, she's going to slowly work her way into the bigger request, into the big ask, right? She's going to ask for a little thing, and then ask for another little thing, and then finally ask for the big thing, right? And this is very common for the ancient world and, and how they would go about it. And frankly, it's probably not that uncommon in our lives today. Um, <laughs> you can think about a child coming to a parent. If the child has some things that they want to get done, they're probably going to start with the easier ask first, right? And then work their way up to the tougher thing. Um, Mom and Dad, could I please have a snack? <laughs> Mom and Dad, could I please have a, a, a a good supper. Mom and Dad, could I please stay up late and watch a movie, <laughs> right? You build your way up to it. You, you prove your worth, you work your way into it. You can see this kind of flow pretty regularly in how we handle things too. Um, and the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. And again, this is a pretty formulaic response from royalty. He, he's saying, hey, ask me for anything, even up to be the second strongest person in the kingdom, right? Up to half. I'll give you just below half, but not half, because then you'd be as strong as me, and we can't have that. But up to half, you can have, right? So this says something about Ahasuerus and his love for Esther. It does. He, he greatly loves her. He greatly respects her. Uh, but Esther is still going to play the game, because that's what you do in the ancient world. It's frankly what we still do in the modern world. We always play the game, because we feel like we have a better shot if we play the game. So that's what Esther's going to do. And Esther said, if it pleases the king... Let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. So here's the request, or the initial request. I want you, it's day 16, I want you to come have dinner with me and bring Haman. I want you and Haman to come have dinner with me. I've made a feast for you, come join me. Okay, oh, well, the king says, that's an easy request. I can go have dinner with my wife, thank you. You made food for me, this is great, right? Uh, easy request, easy answer, yes, for the king. So then the king said, bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. Haman's also probably thinking, <laughs> pretty primo, right? It's pretty not, not bad. I, I'm getting my steak, and I get to eat with the king and the queen, right? Yeah, I can have my cake and eat it too. This is a good day. I, I'm getting everything that I want. I am honored. I am great. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, so again, after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So again, the king says, Eh, this isn't really what you wanted. You wanted to put your life on the line just to have dinner with me, right? That doesn't make any sense. What do you really want, Esther? Again, up to half the kingdom, and I'll give it to you. Whatever you want. It's yours. Ask it. Also notice he's drinking wine, so... We, we've seen Athosuerus earlier. He might have imbibed more than he should have. This would not be out of character for him. Uh, but either way, he's still trying to get to the bottom of this. This is actually faithful too, right? Uh, you can think of the husband or the wife, inversely, who continues to ask, well, what do you want to do tonight, right? Oh, nothing. You can pick. No, no, no. No, really. <laughs> what do you want to do tonight? I want to know what you actually want. Tell me. Verse 7. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Mm -hmm. Alright, so here's the second request. Well, king, what I, what I really want, I want you to come to dinner with me again tomorrow. Come have a meal with me, and then, then I will tell you what I really want. Right? So she's playing coy here, too. Like, Esther is smart. <laughs> right? E Esther is really good at this whole royalty gig. Um, God put her in place for a reason. She is playing the game well. She is setting, <laughs> laying some clues, leading some hints. Um, she's making her husband work for it a little bit, right? Yeah. I, I want you to come to dinner again tomorrow, bring Haman, and, and let's get to the bottom of this, right? Then I'll tell you what I really want. Verse 9, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart, which is to be expected. Whoa. I got to have dinner with the king and the queen today, right? And guess what? The queen invited me back tomorrow. I, I get two days in a row, two nights in a row, where I get to feast with royalty. Oh, 
How lucky am I? How blessed am I? How great am I? Everybody else just pales in comparison to my goodness. I, this is special. My heart is joyful, and I am glad. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. So how long does that joy last? Not long. It's a great reminder that if we're just trying to be happy, if we're just seeking out temporal happiness, it's not going to last. There's always going to be something that drives us up a wall. Always going to be something that irritates us. And in Haman's case, it's this Mordecai guy who, even now that I've had dinner with the king and queen, even now that tomorrow I get invited back, he still won't stand up for me. He still won't serve me. Nevertheless, verse 10, Haman restrained himself. He shows a little restraint. He tries so hard, he keeps the anger in. And he went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Haman sounds like a great host, doesn't he? He invites all these people over, and he says, Oh, look at how great I am. Look at my wealth. Look at my riches. Look at my promotions. Look at my... Don't be Haman, right? <laughs> My advice to you, if you're ever hosting, don't be Haman, right? Uh, verse 12, then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Verse 13, <laughs> yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Isn't this really just pathetic when we stop to think about it? This guy has so much. He's even listing it all, right? Oh, look at how many sons, look at how many blessings, look at all the ways that I have been blessed. But all of it is worthless as long as I keep seeing this Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Reminding me that not everybody worships the ground I walk on. Can't have it, can't do it. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made and in the morning, Tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman and he had the gallows made. Nice um, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, they're a perfect couple for each other, aren't they? Yeah. Um, this is brutal. It is, it's horrible. It, they give him the response. They say, okay, if Mordecai is the last thing in the way of your happiness, we'll just have him killed. Build a special gallows. Um, the word there for gallows in the Hebrew is just tree. Um, eights is the word. So it could just be that it's a spike. Um, we'll see later that some people have taken it to be a cross. Uh, I'm not sure. But 75 feet high is how high this gallows, tree, stake, cross, whatever it is, that's how high it's going to be. Right? So effectively a, a little over a six-story building. Um, and some of the reasons why commentators have thought it's this height is that the palace is probably elevated, and Haman's house is probably a little bit down. So then when he kills Mordecai, and he's at the palace, and he looks out, guess what he gets to see? He gets to see Mordecai hanging there dead. Right? So not only does everybody around see it, right? Because if you hang somebody up 75 feet in the air, people are going to see it. But now, even when I'm serving the king, I can look out, and I can be reminded, oh, the last thing that was in the way of my happiness, there it is, dead, <laughs> killed, crucified. I have no worries, right? And even the word there for hanged upon it, that is the word that would be used if you were going to hang someone by the neck, but it's also the word that you would use if you were just going to like hang someone on a stake or if you were going to hang them on a cross. And it could be taken either way there. My, my initial reaction is that it's probably hanging by the neck, that that's probably what's being described here. Um, but take that how you want to take that. Artists have depicted it different ways. Uh, chapter 6. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Um, so in order to help himself sleep, the king goes and says, oh, let's just look at the history book, <laughs> right? Let, let's read through the history and let's, that, that'll put me right off to sleep. Um, and it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Again, God is at work, right? They're reading through it. They open up this big, great, big book of the Chronicles, right? Just all of the history of the kings of Persia. And what story do they happen to stumble across on this night where the king can't sleep? Mordecai. 
the story of Mordecai saving the king's life. Yeah. Of Mordecai yeah. finding out about this plot to kill the king and turning the culprits in and helping save the king's life. Um, tr truthfully, there probably is even some, I, I, it's a dark comedy, um, but there's some comedic value here as we look through chapter 6 um, of, of what's going on here. A and we're meant to see it in that kind of darkly comic way. Um, Haman's tragedy, but Israel's comedy, if that makes sense. All great stories are either a comedy or a tragedy, right? Some, some measure of both. Th that's what's going on here. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king, these young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Verse 4. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So as all this is going on, night has turned into day, Haman has come back to the palace, and the king has just read this story about Mordecai and how Mordecai has saved him, and he's asking, who is here? Like, which of my advisors is here? Now, Haman is here to kill Mordecai, to get Mordecai killed, to tell the king, hey, I want you to execute this guy. And does that sound like something the king would do? Frankly, yeah. Right? He's already taken 75,000 pounds of silver to just say, hey, I'll kill whoever you want. Right? This would not be out of the realm of possibility. This is what, more, what Haman wants. Um, and, and, but he happens to be there. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. Bring Haman into me. Right? So Haman is still thinking, oh, this is great. I, I get to come in and I get to give my request to the king. Verse 7. Or, oh, pardon me, not there yet. Verse 6. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? The king's pretty vague here. Um, which, of course, adds to the, to the comedy, right? Um, the king is vague. I don't know if this is intentional. If he's, I certainly don't think he's trying to trick Haman or anything. I think he's probably just asking the question, Hey, if I want to honor somebody, what would you do? You're my advisor, right? What would I honor to somebody who is worthy of that. How, how should I honor that? Um, and verse 7, no, pardon me, the end of verse 6. And Haman said to himself, well, whom would the king to delight, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? You can see Haman's pride here. Haman says, well, there's only one guy that the king would want to honor like this. It's me. It's the guy who gets to eat dinner with him and his queen two days in a row. It's the great guy. It's the great Haman. I better come up with a really good honoring, right? Because He's really, he's just beating around the bush here. This is actually for me. That, that's why he hasn't named the person. Because he doesn't want it to, me to know that it's me. That's Haman's thought here. Verse 7. And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. Um, notice here, actually, the, <coughs> pardon, the horse is the one that's wearing the royal crown. Um, I, I know that maybe seems backwards, and actually in the image I have for you, it's opposite. Um, this is a, a picture of what's going to happen, where Mordecai is going to be the one on the horse, and he's the one wearing the crown, he's the one wearing the royal robes. He does get to wear the royal robes, but what's being said here is actually that even the king's horse gets a special crown when the king rides the horse. Right? Um, so Mordecai doesn't quite get to wear the royal crown, but he gets to ride the horse that's wearing the royal horse's crown. Right? Um, so this is a, a, a great honor that's being described. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, right? So give all of this good stuff, give it to one of the noble officials, and then let that noble official dress the man whom the king delights to honor. And let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Hmm. So here's the reward. You get a parade, right? And not just any parade, you get a parade bearing the full weight of the king's authority. You get to wear the royal robes. You get to have the royal advisor coming alongside of you, proclaiming that, yes, this is what it looks like when you treat the king well. You get the power. You get the glory. You get the honor. You get the authority and the might. Right? You get the parade. You get to be recognized throughout the city as someone whom the king loves, whom the king respects, and whom the king has given his, and to whom the king has given his power. Verse ten. Sounds like a pretty good reward, right? Yeah. I, 
be kind of nice if President Biden came over and said to us, hey, I want you to take Air Force One today, and I want you to fly all over the country, and while you're flying, we're going to have a giant loudspeaker placed under the plane that's going to echo out for everybody to hear, <laughs> Pastor Zach <laughs> has done well. <laughs> It'd be kind of fun, right? No, nobody would say no to that. Um, verse 10, then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Again, you can see the comedic twist here, the dark irony here, wherein Haman has come to seek Mordecai's death, and now what is Haman doing instead? <laughs> Leading him around, shouting out praises to Mordecai. Right? Now, in this great story that he was imagining for himself, he's the one who just has to carry the horse, who has to lead the horse, who has to walk through the muddy streets, right? Who has to be shouting out, look at Mordecai, don't look at me, look at Mordecai in the royal robes. He's the one whom the king delights in. He is the one who has the king's honor. Yes. Okay, so Haman has come to the king and requested that all the Jews are supposed to be killed by the end of the year, however it's going. And now the king is honoring a Jew. Yep, and the reason why, the reason why is because actually when we look at the edict, when we look at the order, Haman doesn't tell him who he's killing. Which actually probably speaks again to the negligence of King Ahasuerus, to his unfaithfulness in this duty. Um, if you go back to, where is it? Um, chapter 3, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Notice he doesn't name them. He just says, there's a certain people. And you wouldn't like them. I'm not going to bother you with the name. You don't have to worry about it. We'll take care of it. Just give me the authority to and I will make the edict. So you're right. This seems so weird. Why would the king willingly honor this Jew if he's ordered the Jews killed? But he doesn't know who he's ordered killed. And again, it speaks to his negligence, his, frankly, dereliction of duty, right? Where he's not doing his job as king. Um, but Haman is taking advantage of it. And now, it's kind of coming home to roost on Haman's head, isn't it? <laughs> now Haman is the one leading Mordecai, the Jew, around, <laughs> proclaiming his glory. Um, chapter 6. So Haman took the robes and the horse... And he dressed Mordecai. Oh, can you just imagine Mordecai's or Haman's face while this is going on? Frankly, can you imagine Mordecai's face while this is going on? Like, what's going on? <laughs> right? And led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. So Haman literally covers his face for shame. He, he covers his face. He enters into mourning. He is so embarrassed. He is mortified. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be known. He just wants to die of shame and embarrassment. Verse 13. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, who, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. So these same people who just the night before, right, just on uh, the 16th were saying, Hey, just build him a gallows. Just go have the king try to kill him. And now they're saying, Uh-oh. The portents, the signs, nothing is looking good for you here. This is a really bad omen that as you were trying to kill this man, as you were asking for his execution, you instead being, ended up being his lackey, right? The one walking before him proclaiming his praises. Amen. if he's a Jew and you're trying to kill the Jews and this is what's happening, you're in trouble. You're starting to fall. You're starting to slip and we, we, have, we have no good advice for you. Verse 14, while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Again, you can see the dark comedy here, um, where literally as he goes home on the 17th, 
after he has been mortified, after he has covered his face in shame and despair and anguish, after he has done all of this, as he's talking with his family, as his family is telling him, you're in trouble, man. <laughs> all the king's horses and all the king's men come and grab Haman, and, and they bring him to the king and to Esther for the feast. Right? This is bad news for Haman. And, and again, there's this dark comedy going on here in Esther chapter 6. Verse 7. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request, even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So again, now, the third time the king has asked, What do you want? Right? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I'm ready to give it to you. Then Queen Esther answered, verse 3, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. Again, you can probably see the confusion on King Ahasuerus' face as she asks this question. <laughs> Wait, you want me to save your life? Like, you're my queen. Why would I want you dead? I I'm saying that you can have anything you want. You don't need to be protected from me. I'm here. I've, ar I've already held out the scepter to you. I could have killed you when I had the chance. Right? It it's fine. We're good. What's going on here? Verse 4. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. So she's saying, look, if all you had done was taken money so that we would just be slaves, so that we would just be servants, I would have stayed silent. Because, you know, at least we're helping the king then. Um, you're making money, wh whatever. Like, we can be slaves. We've done it before. There's that whole Egypt thing several hundred years ago, right? We've been slaves before. I wouldn't have bothered. But it's not just slavery that we've been sold into. We have been sold into death. You have taken blood money so that my people and me, that all of us, would be killed. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? The king said, I have done no such thing, right? I have not proclaimed that I want you dead. I have not wanted your people dead. I, I've never said anything like that. Who has done this? And Esther said, oh, just the dramatic effect here, right? A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. <laughs> and now the comedy, right, is clearly the tragedy on Haman's end. This foe, this enemy, this wicked Haman he is the one who has sold my people into death. He is the one who has tricked you, O king, and has said that it would be better for all of us to be dead. He is the one who has done this. The wicked foe is sitting here in this room with us. It's why I've invited him to dinner the last two nights, because Haman is the enemy. Because Haman is the one who wants me and my people put to death. Verse 7. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. This has been a trend with this king too. Remember, he was very mad the first time we saw him drinking wine in the account when Queen Vashti wouldn't come. Um, again, he rises up in his wrath from his wine drinking and he goes out into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. So Haman, again, Haman is smart, right? He's prideful, he's arrogant. And in many ways, he is dumb. But he is also intelligent. And he knows that he has lost all chance of hope with the king. So who does he go to? Queen. He goes to the queen. He says, Queen Esther, please, please, please. I know what I did was wrong. He's begging. He's on his knees. He's saying everything that I have said was wrong. I, I was wrong. And, and you're the only one who can save me. And you don't really want me to die. Uh, that would be bad. Uh, I, I can be of service to you. I have wealth. I have money. I have means. I have power. Whatever. We, we don't get to hear what he's just saying as he's groveling. But he is groveling before Queen Esther. Because he says, I got no chance with the king. My only chance is for Queen Esther, the one whom I have offended first, right? The first offense, to say to the king, he's not worth your time. Just let him live. And that's his only chance. But verse 8. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. 
So Esther is kind of laying out on the couch, right? This is typically how you would recline for dinner in the ancient world. And we didn't normally have chairs and tables like this. The, the table was normally low to the ground, and you would be reclining on a couch or a, or a mattress of some sort. And Haman is falling on his knees at Esther's feet um, as she's laying on her couch. And so what the king sees when he comes in is that he is assaulting her, that he is making a move on her, that he is <laughs> compounding his evil, right? That he is bit making a, a bigger issue here, a bigger problem. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? And as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. So notice, just a chapter before, Haman's face was covered in shame, right? Now Haman's face is covered in death, frankly, right? This is the headman's mask that is coming over him. You can picture any medieval movie, right, where they put a, a mask over someone's face as they're being led to their execution. This person has, is frankly not a person anymore, right? That's why you cover their face, because they are so wicked, they are so evil, they are so broken that you don't even want to look at them. You can't even see their face. It's just too horrible to behold. This is what the king does. In verse 9, Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover the gallows, again that word there is just tree, Moreover the tree that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king. Notice he, he's outlining why it's absurd that Haman wanted Mordecai dead in the first place. Mordecai was someone who saved the king, and this is what Haman wants dead, right? Was he ever really for the king? No. No, Haman was always about Haman. And that's what the eunuch is pointing out here at the end of Haman's life. And the king said, hang him on that. And so this is the end of the irony, right? This is the end of the, the tragedy. This is where the dark comedy comes to its full conclusion where the tree that was prepared for Mordecai's death instead holds who? Yeah. Haman. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king was abated. Right. So, hey, we did it. We got through chapter 7. I told you we could do it. I told you we could do it. Um, but I, I want to unpack this just a little bit. Um, obviously, in some ways, this is a horrible story, right? It, it, I mean, we shouldn't take the light in the death of anyone. We, we really, really shouldn't. Um, but, but as we think about this story, I, I wanted to show you this image and kind of talk about how it applies to Christ, or at least how I see it applying to Christ and to that message of salvation. Um, these last two images, by the way, um, you could find these in the Hague, um, in that palace. There you have these panels from some ancient medieval, it's, probably, it's in the 15th century, so sometime in the 1400s, some artist was drawing up this account of Esther, right? And so you can even see here, does this look like the Middle East or does this look like Europe? It looks like Europe, right? This is a, a pretty common motif within art where you'll take the biblical story and you'll put it into your context. Um, but what do they have Haman hanging on? A cross. A cross. Now, the reason why I want to point this out is that I think a wrong interpretation of this, and one that has cropped up throughout history, um, is that they've actually taken this and they've said, well, Haman is actually a prefiguring of Christ, right? Haman is someone who is hanged on a tree because the Jews hate him, right? And so you can see the argument that's being made there, but it's a false argument. It's, it's not actually looking at the story um, Frankly, it's looking at the story through an anti-Jewish lens, right? Through an anti-Semitic lens and saying, well, the Jews are the real problem in Esther. Haman, he was just doing the right thing. He just wanted to kill the Jews. Again, this makes no sense when you actually start to unpack this argument. Um, but th that's the argument. Haman wanted the Jews dead because they've sinned, because they're unworthy, because they don't deserve God's grace. And then when the Jews rebelled against him, they killed him, right? They hung him on the tree just like they hung Jesus on the tree. Um, and again, you can hear echoes of this really throughout any real anti-Semitic message, right? Which shouldn't be our role as Christians. Now, are Jewish people who do not believe in Jesus saved? No. no. It's only through faith in Christ. So actually our hearts should be breaking for them and we should be trying to get them, point them to the promise that Jesus has for the Jew and the Greek, right? For all people that only in him is their salvation found. 
Um, but the flip side of that, and it's something that the church has engaged with. Actually, even Luther has written some things that I think we would rightly look at and be like, ugh, that maybe wasn't the best thing to say there, right? Now, those comments that Luther makes are always taken out of context, right? They're, they're, like they're never, what? huh? Like what? What does Luther say? Luther has basically said, there are a couple of quotes, I don't have them off the top of my head uh, right away, but they're effectively to the, that the Jews are evil and they're being That's punished what by God. Luther complains about the G hates the Jews. Yeah, Luther does complain about that several times. What he's actually complaining about in the in the wider context is just their continued rejection of Christ, that they continue to rebel oh, against hold Christ. Hold on a second. Yes. The Jews don't believe, but they're God's people. And as times they have faith that God is going to preserve. And is they, are they dead or are they going to be go to heaven? And nobody knows. Nobody knows anything. I would say that the way that scripture says it, salvation is found in Christ alone. Or, yes, but Christ wasn't there. Christ died, but they believed. Some of them believed that they Oh yeah, Christ. for sure. I, I mean, if you're Jewish and you believe in Christ, you're for sure saved, right? It, it's the same thing for us. If you are, if you are German, Polish, a little Native American, a little French, right? If you're some mongrel American, and you believe in Jesus. You're saved. You're saved. But what about those who never know Jesus or hear about him? They we don't know. Only God knows. Is that correct? For those who do not... Oh, or are you asking about like pre-Jesus? No, I'm talking Indians who never... People yeah. who never heard. That's one of those things where, yes, we trust that God is gracious. But the scriptures are pretty clear that I in order to be saved, that. you got to know Jesus, right? Jesus has to save you. Like and and so in the midst of that, about Jesus, and they were they knew about him, yeah. but they knew that they how am I going to say this? You know, like Moses and all of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, Moses and all of them. I feel good about because they're looking forward to the promise that Messiah. But I mean, right? whether you have to yeah. be that that person, but it can, you can be a little person, and you have heard, then you will be saved. Yeah, and the scripture is not clear on that other than to say that faith comes by hearing. hearing. And that you are saved by grace through faith. faith. And so what Paul says then is, if there's people who haven't heard, what should we be doing? Telling them. Going Hold and telling on a them. second. Now, what about yeah. those who are mentally sick? For, yeah, so one of the great comforts we have, right, um, is, is that it's God who does the saving work. Um, so the image that comes to my mind with that is a faithful Christian, right, who now is suffering from extreme dementia or Alzheimer's and no longer really remembers anything. Wow. Now, of note there, um, I've talked with a lot of people in that situation, in that state, and it is shocking to me how many of them know the Lord's Prayer still, right? Or how many of them can sing some of our well-loved hymns um, that still are just floating around in there because the Spirit's still doing His work. Yes, but um, I've been in but, places. But we've, but we've been in those places, right, where they don't have any of that, too. Now, my great promise and my reminder is that how are we saved? It is through Christ's grace, right? And is that grace something that has been a part of that person's life? Yeah. Yes. So I, I'm not super worried about them. Tr truthfully, I think I'm actually more confident for them because of how gracious God is. I, I think... They've probably lost, actually, the will and the ability to go away from God at that point. I, I think they're pretty secure in the gifts and the promises that God has spoken to them in baptism, in the sacraments, in the preaching of the yes, but I understand that, but I've been in those places, too, and I've seen things that I... Yeah, yeah. Just... I, I have, too. And, and again, that's where we cast ourselves on the mercy of God, and we say, hey, God, you're the one who saves, right? But it's only through Jesus. And so we got to keep pointing people to Jesus. We got to keep promoting Jesus. We got to keep proclaiming that good news of Jesus to all, so that they all can be saved, right? So they all can be brought into that gracious promise. Um, so this is the wrong way of looking at it, in, in my estimation. We shouldn't see Haman as the Christ figure, but I do think the death of Haman plays a role, or at least prefigures something within the narrative of Christ. Um, so I said I've got this month of Nisan. I've got this calendar up here. Um, Haman dies on Nisan 17, right? So you have Haman's edict issued on the 13th day. You've got three days where Esther waits 
on that third day, she has her first audience with the king on the 16th, and then on the 17th, the day after that, that's when they have the second audience and Haman is executed. Haman is hung on the tree, right? Whether that's hanging by the neck, whether it's a cross, I'd probably go hanging by the neck, but do what you want to do with that. Now, the reason why I think this is important and why I have the calendar up here, does anybody know what day Nisan 14 is in the Jewish calendar? I didn't think you would, no offense. <laughs> this is the day of Passover. Right? Nisan 14 is the day of Passover. So let's, let's play this out. Let's look at the calendar in Christ's day. Okay? So Nisan 14, you have the Passover. That's Monday, Thursday. The next day, the 15th, that's Good Friday. Sorry, I know these aren't going to come up well on the camera or readable for you, but I, I'm writing them down anyway. The next day, the 16th, that's Holy Saturday. And what does that make Nissan 17? Easter. 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 Nissan 17 is the day that God defeats death for his people. The day that God puts to death, death. Isn't it interesting then that as we look at the story of Esther, Nisan 17 is the day that God puts to death, death for his people. That he delivers them from Haman. That he delivers them from the evil one. That he delivers them from sin and death. Right? Now, I can't actually prove this. Right? So this is my Bible study um, application. This is my reminder that, I, that this is just something that I noticed as I was looking at these days and I was looking at the calendar and as I was putting it together in my head that on this 17th perhaps there's a parallel here between the deliverance that we get on Easter and the deliverance that God gives to his people on Nisan 17 in the book of Esther. Now again, it's possible that there's more days in between here. It's possible that we, we don't have it all lined out. But as I look at the account of Esther, this is my best guess at the calendar. And then as I pair that calendar with what I see in Jesus' life, I see a holy day in the lives of God's people. A day when God has defeated evil for us. A day when God has defeated our great enemy, that is death, and replaced it with life. And so as I think about the book of Esther... That's something that I'm going to take away from our time together. So thank you for helping me study the book of Esther so that I, I could look and see this. Um, because I think this is something that God doesn't have accidents. God doesn't have coincidences. God puts things together for a reason. And I think the reason here is to point us to that promise of Easter. To that great Nisan 17 that was foreshadowed in the defeat of the enemy that is Haman. And that is brought to reality in the death of death. On Easter. And with that, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we give you thanks and praise that in your Son, Christ Jesus, you have defeated death for us. As your people throughout history have known your deliverance, as Esther helped deliver your people from Haman and his wickedness, we pray that you will continue to help deliver us from evil today. Lord, be with us, be near us, point us to the promises that are ours in Christ. And in all things, help us to proclaim that saving work to all, that all might be brought into that blessed reality that is the resurrection. Lord, bless this food that we are going to eat, that it might nourish our bodies and it might strengthen and sustain us for the tasks ahead. That in all things, we might proclaim that saving victory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone.